We have to open our country. You know, I, I had an expression, the cure can't be worse than the problem itself, right? Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to EDGE 2020, the series, the new program of the Government Business Executive Forum. First, I want to thank, let me take this off, I want to thank our members who are here physically and our members who are here virtually. I also want to thank past attendees of CES Government who are on with us today as well. We appreciate your being part of our program in Las Vegas every year, and we're going to provide a little update at this time is also want to recognize our chairman in Europe, uh, Gilbert Revillon. I know you're at your place in the south of France. I know a lot of us would like to be there. And Lim Vermeer, one of our members. Lim, I know you're watching in the Netherlands. Lim has a business that does a lot of work with the federal government and uh, has been trying to get back here from the, he spends two weeks in Amsterdam and two weeks here every month, except for March. He hasn't been here and is having a hard time getting back. And Ian Liddell Granger, our friend from the United Kingdom, thank you for being on as well. With that, I want to spend just a couple of minutes about what is EDGE and what are we planning with this series. Is um, All of us have been rocked by COVID, every part of our economy, every part of the world. The GBF, uniquely though, has always been a smaller organization. It's always been executive level and it exists for one purpose. It, it really exists to enable substantive relationships and discussions between people who make a difference in how technology is applied to government. Our events are smaller and it gives us a lot of flexibility to do things, and especially now in this COVID kind of COVID rock world. We have our program is, uh, with the, we are going to talk a little bit today. We have two membership levels. And I have the clicker that I put in my pocket. And so one of the things that, that we have, the GBF program has always been four to six, three or four hour programs that build toward our flagship event in Las Vegas each year. What we're doing as a result of COVID, COVID maybe prompted it, but it's really going to be our business model going forward. And this is for our members and for those that will be interested in, I think, the general membership is we are, have, we are producing 12 interactive programs very much like today. Not all virtual, not all physical. For our executive committee members, these programs are for you. This is what we do. You have the choice of attending physically as your comfort level allows, given your own circumstances with your health and your family, relatives, etc. Or you can attend virtually. We're introducing a general membership for both government and industry that will allow virtual participation in these programs. And I mean, I don't mean just watch it over, hunched over your uh, iPad. I mean real participation. We have Q&A that's going to come in. We're going to keep getting better and better at, that, at this, and a really participatory agenda. In addition, twice a year, the GBF is going to produce, in addition to our premier events, we're going to have two receptions that are going to be worth flying in for if you are in another jurisdiction of government across the United States or if, you're a, if you are a business doing business with government, it's something you'll want to attend because we want to have the premier receptions very much along the scale of what we do in Las Vegas. So if you're, we've included more people in this first virtual program than before, and we're going to be introducing the general membership next week, www.gbeforum.com, and you'll, you'll see information, and we'll be reaching out to you as well. Keep waiting for you to do the slides, and I have it. This is the agenda. 
Now, what we try to do with our agendas is we try to make it a little more interesting. I'm ADD or ADHD or whatever it is. And I have a hard time paying attention to anything. And so for an extended period of time. So we try to make it something that's interactive, that's interesting, that has different component parts. And we will always have a government perspective on a mission of government, a technology-driven mission of government by a senior executive who plays an important role in, what, what, in providing the technologies that drive the mission of the respective agency or department. We also have a general speaker at each program. And today for our inaugural, I, you're going to hear from Jamie Holcomb, the CIO for the Patent and Trademark Office, and Lucas Kaczynski, who is one of the first American to qualify for the US Olympic shooting team, the 2020 Olympics. And it's an interesting program. These are the subjects that you can see on your screen that we have planned so far. And I can guarantee that some of these are going to be very provocative. In other words, before the election, for example, we're going to have two perspectives on what to look for, what it means to our industry, and, and a forecast. We have next on September 2nd is we are going to do that critical infrastructure and air travel. Our general interest is probably going to be a couple of us will be at the Buffalo Trace Distillery, for example, with a, with a distiller talking about how they make, make Kentucky bourbon during the week of the Kentucky Derby, of course, if it goes. But that's an example of our agenda. And next year, we're going to have 12 programs. But for our organization, and the big distinguishing differentiator for us is for 15 years, we produce what is government technology's global stage. For us, all roads lead to Las Vegas. Very cool video, isn't it? But it also says a lot. We've all been cooped up now for three or four months. And we're starting a return across this country that's important. It's important for our country. It's important for all of us. And we, as an organization, are small enough that we're able to, to blend the hybrid model in small numbers and grow as, we, as, it, as is appropriate. But here we have our physical members. We have 40 of our members who are, have a comfort level to attend. We do thermal temperatures, masks a hand sanitizer, and we have virtual attendees. But we want to be part of the front end of coming back, not doing it when everybody else does. Which takes us to CES and CES government, which I will explain we are rebranding to Edge at CES. Now, Gary Shapiro is one of my close friends and president and CEO of the Consumer Technology Association. And we've had a number of discussions for the last uh, few months. And because COVID and the unpredictable nature of what that virus has done is CES moved from 170,000 to 100,000 and made the tough decision to go all virtual. But I can tell you that in terms of virtual confer conferences, there will be no virtual experience quite like they produce in January. For us, there's a big difference between 100,000 people and 250. Normally, we have over 400 people at the conference, but because of social distancing and current circumstances, we're limited to 250. GBF members are going to be uh, getting, receiving their invitations to register at the end of the month. And we will, we can't announce the plans yet, but we have a lot, a lot of initiatives underway that are gonna make this one of the most cool events for coming out of COVID. That, that, we, that our industry has produced, and I think we're going to set a pretty good model. We will be working with CES to integrate our program with theirs and theirs with ours in meaningful ways. And in terms of membership, so that everyone knows, is our plan is for GBF members, general members or executive committee, 
That's how you get into CES government going forward. Now, I'd also like to thank, I know Sean DeGay is here and Carolyn Hyde, who's going to come up here in a minute, our co-chairs for EDGE 2021 at, uh, at EDGE 2021 Washington, D.C. We, we, the reason that we have moved to EDGE as opposed to CES government, our entire program is going to be built around the concept of EDGE. EDGE, the program of 12 activities, EDGE at CES. We are still the premier partner and very proud to continue as the premier partner of the world's most important and prestigious technology showcase, which is CES. But we're adding CE or EDGE Washington, D.C. in the summer. More a tech policy program. We anticipate bringing in executives from jurisdictions, not just, not just American government, but our partner nations as well. And remember the GBF, while we are largely federal, U.S. federal centric, we recognize that every mission of the United States necessarily is, is executed in another jurisdiction and we include them in our programming. So with that, to introduce our first guest, I'd like to bring up our EDGE 2021 Washington, D.C. co-chair, Vice President of Veritas. Please welcome Carolyn Hyde. Are you here? Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. After this. You're not even you're not even on yet. You'll see yourself. My objective here in the next couple of minutes will be, one, to tell you where we are with AI and machine learning, and two, to get off the stage as quick as possible. How are we doing? I don't know. How are we doing? Uh, thank you, Don, uh, and welcome everyone to the first of seven EDGE programs that take us into December and set us up perfectly for Las Vegas. Jamie, we are especially delighted to have you here with us, and we deliberately showed that brief segment from CES government. Yours was one of the highest rated presentations. Did Don tell you this before? See, he was keeping it from you. The highest rated presentations at CES government 2020, and you were the one presenter whose slides didn't work. Well, you were masterful without them, and we've tested and tested to make sure that your slides will indeed work today. Those here at American Prime have his biography, but for our virtual participants, here is a brief overview. Jamie Holcomb has served as CIO for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office since February of 2019 and has been directing some extraordinary innovations by driving technology into the PTO core mission. Jamie has a record of leadership in both business and military. In business, he has held a spectrum of executive roles, from vice president and general manager for a major Harris Corporation division, to the CEO of a cybersecurity startup among several. In business, well, in service to our country, Jamie Holcomb distinguished himself as the company commander of the 1116th Signal Battalion and was awarded both the Douglas MacArthur Leadership Award as well as Most Outstanding Officer of the Year. He graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So first, I want to say thank you for your service. That is tremendous. Thank you. We are delighted to have you here, Jamie. Thank you on behalf of the Government Business Executive Forum. Welcome to GBEF EDGE 2020. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I really appreciate it. You know, whenever you get up in front of a stage and so forth, you're humbled by the people that surround you. And I've been humbled throughout my life. Um, it was an honor for me to graduate from the academy. I was given that opportunity. And I took it to heart that I was to lead young men and women in the service of our country. But one of the things I found out throughout my whole career was people need to understand what their mission is in order to give their heart over to it. And as a leader, your obligation, your duty, is to make sure people understand that mission. And so with that, I'm trying to show you that mission matters here at the USPTO. All right, so what do we do? We award patents and trademarks. That's easy. But the fact of the matter is people don't know a lot about intellectual property. It is a very complex subject that you shouldn't shy away from. Just because it's hard does not mean that you shouldn't participate. Think about the slide deck that came before. 10 million patents in the United States in June of 2018. 10 million, and now we have about 10,600,000. That's what separates us from the rest of the world in the modern age, is the ability of our intellect to take ideas and using the capitalistic system to prosper and to profit and to share that profitability throughout the world. Do you think in your mind that the rest of the world would be as well off if we were not profitable? Where do people think all of this advance and progress comes from? It can only come from profits. If you are only doing your operational expenditures and you never make a profit, you can't progress. Think about that. How do you progress without profit? You can't. Without profit, and profit is the capitalistic way. It's how we've raised the poor all around the world. You think about it. In today's day and age, there is no better age for um, health, for food, for people all around to understand the information that we provide through the inventions that we give. Whew. So with that, I'll talk about the actual PTO. There's patents, trademarks, but there's two other parts of intellectual property as well. Copyrights, which is a different branch altogether. It's in the legislative branch under the uh, Library of Congress. The registrar is over there in copyrights. Also, trade law. No matter what, if you have company secrets, the trade law protects that. And so who has jurisdiction over the trade law is the FBI. And we actually teach the FBI on intellectual property and how they can enforce the intellectual property rights that we establish at the patent office. We're not an adjudicating arm, right? We tell people about intellectual property and we award patents and trademarks. So, the IT shop is a mission enabler. That's what I found out in the Army when I was in communications and intelligence. And so because of that, I just want to make sure that people understand IT for IT's sake is a fool's errand. You need to have a mission for IT to enable the business. And that's what I reinvigorated into the PTO when I came aboard. It's not that it was doing bad, it was doing great. Obviously, 10 million patents. But what had happened was everybody was doing IT for IT's sake. And so what I've tried to do then is to say, no, we award patents and trademarks. And if you can't figure out what your mission is around that patents and trademarks, then we have to have a talk. Network engineers are essential and important. But the fact of the matter is they have to be around patents and trademarks. So. We have a multi-year effort to stabilize, secure, and modernize our systems and our infrastructure. And what that means is the PTO, like a lot of organizations in the government, accumulates technical debt because they just want to get the mission done. And they don't realize that keeping up with technology is just as important because eventually you get to a point where your debt overcomes. And then you can't back up. Then you can't upgrade. And so over the last 18 months, we've done a great job in stabilizing and securing the PTO systems and infrastructure. And it's very important to secure as well. 
There are a lot of bad actors out there in the world who want to steal our property. And so we have a mission to, and a duty to protect those secrets and make sure that the patent and trademark system is secure. Now, some of the numbers, we have over 8,000 examiners and 5,000 other support staff nationwide. We have five different regional offices throughout America. And our major office is in Alexandria. Prior to COVID breaking out, those 8,000 or so examiners, they were actually remotely working anyway. We encouraged that in the 2012, 2013 timeframe. And so every morning I would walk in and see 7,800, 8,200 people remotely logging in. As I said before, we were stabilizing and securing our infrastructure, including in that in January, serendipity, in January, we almost doubled our bandwidth because we're gonna get ready to move to the cloud. Now in doing that, I wasn't planning for COVID, but damn, <laughs> Whew. I was certainly happy we had more bandwidth because I was able to, with a flick of a switch, scale up that first week and we put 6,000 additional people on our backbone. And we did, have to incur, uh, we did have to incur licenses and other hardware, but we scaled up and we were able to hit 14,000 simultaneous VPN connections every day for the past four months. Now you can see the Patent and Trademark Office is in demand. Well, I've already said how great we're doing with our remote telework and so forth. Can you believe that our productivity has actually increased year over year? Well, how is that possible? I mean, you're, you're only 100%, right? Nobody's taking vacation. <laughs> so everybody's doing work. So our numbers are off the charts. They've never been as good. And you're not gonna believe this one too. We had more trademarks registered in July of 2020 than ever before. More filings. That's amazing. The engine of growth is kicked into high gear. People have figured out how to use this electronic economic activity to their advantage. So, our telework is outstanding. Updated our legacy like I told you about, we scaled it and we increased our customer satisfaction. Now you can imagine just taking your laptop home and doing your telework is not the same as having two huge screens in front of you to be able to see all this different work. So the examiners had to have these large monitors and so we shipped them remotely to their homes for those 6,000 additional people. That was a tough thing because we had to track that throughout uh, the three months that it took. All right, let's see what we got. Oh, patents for partnerships. That is a great thing that I encourage everyone to go out and look with when you go home. Why? We did that within the first 10 days of COVID because we wanted the ability for people to understand what they could license as far as COVID-19. So when you go there, the inventors of these great um, inventions and patents, they are putting up that they can license this um, product for use in COVID-19. They're just looking for someone, some business, to take that idea and run with it and actually offer it to the public. So please go out and look for patents for partnerships. It's people dying for business. Also, we put out the image file wrapper within 90 days, and in mid-July, we were able to put out and I, I don't want to go into all the crazy stuff on tech because I love it, but it's the high definition tech files with images and so forth, which show all of the different diagrams for all the inventions that are public. And so we released that within 90 days. Let's see, we talked about stabilization and security, modernization. All right, we are continually redefining the roadmap. Now, most of the folks here with the U.S. federal government know what the cloud is. It's easy. And I will say that the USPTO hit the goal of data center consolidation 10 years ago. We only have one data center. <laughs> so, of course, that has its inherent problems, right? We do have a backup place, but this backup place is in the side of a mountain, and it's not very 
up to date. If I was going to conduct the nuclear war from that Iron Mountain, it would be okay. But that's not what we're doing. We're doing pads and trademarks. So we're going to move the backup sites elsewhere. We're going to put them out in the cloud. And we're going to be able to operate in a hot, hot configuration instead of the hot, cold configuration that we have right now. That is the new ways of business, the new ways of working. And so that's what modernization is all about. We will also prevent lock-in to any vendors. One of the biggest lessons learned, I think, in the US federal government is cloud is not in and of itself cheap. In fact, it can be more expensive. You have to figure out what architecture suits your applications and then apply the right tool to the right job. So a lot of ingress and egress of data from cloud was not taken into account. And many uh, agencies ran out of operational funds without even realizing what they were getting into. So we'll go in with eyes wide open. Also, we talked about new ways of working very briefly, but I will say that I'm getting my folks to think differently. And why is that? The examiners I'm not talking about. It's the support staff. Why do you think that a customized tool that was developed 10, 15 years ago is adequate? It's not. So what you have to do is think about how to get those new inventions into the hands of the examiners so that they can actually do and uh, do their job quicker, do their job cheaper. And so in order to do that, we went from a very complex project management organization to a product operation. And that is using product catalog. We took over 158 different disparate projects and mapped them to 30 products. You'll see right there, on the slide that there's four product lines. Very simply, it's patents, trademarks, business or back office, and IT or infrastructure. And those four product lines are what compose the entire PTO portfolio. Each one of the product lines has a manager, but more importantly, each of those boxes represent a product team with a product owner from the business. So the biggest difference is from projects with tech guys leading it to products with the business leading it because it's all about business value that counts. That's the mission, the business, not just because of technology. So now what we're doing is we have a product owner from the business and we have tech architects and developers from IT. And we've also brought in procurement specialists and logisticians and others into the product teams. So now we have a product-oriented and operated organization. We'll take that into full effect on the 1st of October. I'm really looking forward to that. Technology. Well, when I got there, you should see how hard it is <laughs> to figure out how to make a patent. It's just, it, it still boggles my mind. Now, just because it's complex doesn't mean you don't have a right to make it simple. So I have three ABCs of the new ways of working. Act now, be bold, and simplify. Wait a minute, simplify starts with an S. But you'll never forget simplify starting with a C now, right? So that's it, ABC, act now, be bold, and simplify. And that's what I'm asking everybody on the product team to do. Not just to sit back and do the same checklist you've always done, but rather take that checklist and figure out what you can do with robotic process automation and figure out how you can make a 10-step checklist, four steps, and you don't have to do anything, that the robot can do it all himself or in the background. And we're giving incentivized people to do that. By the way, if people really want to get involved, you can certify yourself on something like UiPath, um, no, no, no plug, but you, all these new organizations with RPA and stuff are giving certifications. You can get it online in four weekends. Go out and get it. Once those folks show me that they want to do that, then they're put on the team and they're developing. It's outstanding. It's a good way. And I've got this new effort underway in HR. I'm driving HR crazy. It's uh, people to teams. 
And what does that mean? Well, wouldn't it be great if as a federal government employee, a GS guy, you show up for work and you say, hey, I really think my best efforts would be spent if I worked on that team over there. I've given that challenge to my HR. Now, can you do that all the time? Of course not. You know, there's some guys who are going to have to suck it up and go to those product teams that are really tough, right? But there are the other side of it where you can go with AI and RPA and other challenging and exciting things that you want to do. We need to make it more challenging for our folks in the federal government to stay, to keep those challenges. Now, I don't have a problem either, by the way, with tenured people at the USPTO. One of the biggest things I found out was the average tenure of a PTO employee is like 22 years. What? Aren't you supposed to retire at 20? That's the way it is in the military. Anyway, then I find out that they're also retiring at like 35 and 40 years. So it's a great place to work. It's just I have to keep challenging them to change, right? Because once you get set in your ways, it's just human nature. You don't want to get up and do different things. And so we're challenging people to do different things. You can see there's a lot of different things on technology. The biggest thing I'll point out, though, is loosely coupling things. And the architecture is really simple. It's like this. If I'm going to put in a tool today, I better be able to rip it out tomorrow because there might be a better tool that comes in. Prior to this, there's an attitude that if it's not invented here, it's not good. Well, we need to erase that and eliminate that attitude. Also, we need to say this Rube Goldberg machine, this wet work process that we have, when you take one thing away and all of a sudden it doesn't work. If anybody doesn't know what a Rube Goldberg machine, you know, those dominoes with the marbles and the, the iron as it comes down. And yeah, it's really crazy. So what we need to do is have something loosely coupled in microservices, the ability to mix and match and put things in and take things out. And that's what we're going to do. In order to do that, we have to change our contracts. Oh my goodness. This has really been the bane of my existence. Yes, we are working very closely with the Office of Procurement now. And I will say that my contracting officers are now with the right mindset. I do think that prior to this, over the last 18 months, there's sort of been a, what the heck do you think you're doing, Jamie? You can't do it that way. And I challenged them and I said, yes, you can. And in fact, one of the big things we're doing is using existing GWACs like Alliant 2 or Soup or T4NG or CIOSP3. By the way, for you folks that don't know it, that's just jargon for government contract vehicles that already exist and they're working elsewhere. Why does the USPTO have to create something new? It doesn't make sense. It's just a lot of overhead and a lot of excessive money. Use what currently exists. The GSA loves it when you do that. Of course, they're taking a little bit, but that's okay. You know, everybody needs their little bit in order to do the well. So the fact of the matter is use what exists. And then Congress has given the PTO the ability to do the PTAG, which is the Patent and Trademark Acquisition Guidelines. So here's a public service announcement for those folks who want to do business at the PTO. The fact of the matter is, if you see an RFI come out, a request for information, and you never see a follow-up request for proposal, it's because we don't have to do it. We can award directly from an RFI. And why is that? Because of the patent and trademark acquisition guidelines. It allows us to down-select from an RFI and use our best commercial terms as we see fit. So that's a good thing that Congress has given us, and we'll use it to our advantage. And then, of course, we have our full FAR compliant contracts at the USPTO. The one that currently exists, which I can't talk about right now, is called BOSS, the Business Oriented Support Systems. So one of the things that this chart shows, though, is how development was one contract. Operations and maintenance was one contract. Testing was one contract. Well, how do you deliver something if you have five different contracts in order to get it to the delivery site and to get it to deploy? Uh, vendors were pointing fingers at one another saying, no, I can't do this, or 
Yeah, it was incentivized for the testers not to let the developers go because it was a different company. So instead of that, we're trying to do these new contracts, which I just showed you the GWACs are available, but you have task orders on Boss or another GWAC, which go across all those functional levels. And so that's where I've got the contracting officers to think differently. And I think I finally got them to turn the corner because they're espousing it and putting their arms around it. And in fact, there's nowhere that's seen better than artificial intelligence and machine learning. We have six different programs, three each, on patents and trademarks. One of our biggest successes has been in classification. We're able to classify patents as they come in using machine supervised learning. In other words, the actual patent examiners sit there and give feedback on the algorithms, whether or not the 10 that were presented are good or bad. They can put a thumbs up or a thumbs down, as well as they can see the relative ranking and put them in that type of um, order. Once that's done, then it's thrown back into the neural network feedback loop, and we get even better precision on the next classification. There is something on the order of 3,000 different categories. The term of art used is an art unit. Uh, and an art unit can be, as an example, micro, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mechanical biology or biomechanical devices. There's one. Uh, textiles is one. Mechanical devices might be another one. But we found that when you're doing natural language processing, unless you have the specific syntax and context trained in that algorithm, a biomedical algorithm has no bearing on a textile. And so you can't use those algorithms. You have to actually have filtering done at the top in order to get to that sixth and seventh level where we found we have good success. So that was my presentation. And I wanted to open it up to a lot of questions because I think a lot of things can be shared. I really believe in the mission of the GBEF. I think that it's great that we can exchange all these ideas. You know, in a non-confrontational world where people are not coming to ask me if I can buy their stuff. <laughs> I do. Mr. Charles Church, I know that guy. And even though he's an Annapolis grad, I'll give him the floor. Go Navy beat Army. Hey, I'm sorry I'm not wearing a coat and tie and joining you today, Jamie. I'm come calling in from Virginia Beach here, being a good Navy guy. Hey, quick question. I, I know your organization put out a few RFIs over the last few years. And uh, with the pandemic that we're still in, how has that affected your thinking on as a service? That's a great question because as a service means it's usually offered out on the web and you have to actually get through all the procurement hurdles that you would normally face in the FAR. Now, FedRAMP is a big deal. If things aren't FedRAMPed, we're not supposed to use it because they're not, quote, secure. Well, I've challenged that one too. So in essence, what I will do is I will give a temporary FedRAMP interim authority to operate and do a proof of concept on as a service, almost anything. Heck, if we could find, you know, I don't know, reams of paper to buy as a service, I'll do it. And why is that? Because you want to take your capital expenditures and make them operational expenditures so we're not getting into the thing of buying servers and, and uh, the whole infrastructure of the cloud over and over and over again. That is not a good way to do business. And it's proven to be very costly for the federal government. So... And as a service, we are very open to that in so far as we have to make sure it is secure. So we'll remediate those vulnerabilities as we find them before we do a full up operation. And that's also to prevent vendor lock-in, right? Because vendors love it if you come to them and then they get stickier and stickier and stickier and you keep going down to the hole and you're like, get me out of here. So you have to prevent vendor lock-in from the beginning to make sure you can go in between different cloud providers as a service. You never want to get locked in. And one of the first requirements in any of my applications will be, how do I export my data to your competitor? 
If you can't tell me how you do it, I probably don't want to do business with you. That's only a good thing to do. You should be able to be proud enough and confident enough in your application that I'm not going to leave. But if I do, I need to have the out. Did that answer your question, Charles? Hey, thank you, Jamie. That's a great one. Have a great day. You too, buddy. That man just defeated, hey, defeated cancer, by the way. Hua. Congrats. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Jamie. You back for your Smith from ASRC. Nice to see you again. Great to see you. Um, first, I want to commend on your product. We already have that, obviously, in, in product managers in our own agile thinking, so this is just going to the next level. Um, but talking about product, have you released any products yet? Are you in acquisition or are you planning to soon? And what type, what, what might the first? Sure, understood. The first products oriented is the artificial intelligence BPA. Now it's a smaller BPA, and there was an award of about 12 or 14 vendors on it, and we're currently executing against that right now. And if you guys didn't know, we have a partnership with Google, Accenture, and the USPTO on artificial intelligence search. Within six months, we completed what it took six years the USPTO to do before and that is create those search algorithms I was just talking about in relative ranking and so forth. Six months to six years, that's a big difference. And that's because commercial terms were used, not government terms. So, do, will we have future product-oriented contracts? Yes. Our boss is intended to be product-oriented such that we can have those development, testing the full functionality throughout. So I'm hoping that boss is that one. But we'll use GWAX uh, and existing contracts out there in order to get the products done. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Questions in the back. Oh. Sure. Okay. Sorry. I probably use the uh, TES system several times a month. I file trademarks for people. One, and it's a great system, by the way. Easy to go through. The most difficult part, and probably takes me 200% of my time, is trying to find the right code for the product that you are trying to trademark. Is there any way to make that a little easier? I'll tell you, the last thing I did was for uh, mats for uh, construction equipment to go over mud. And believe me, that took me like an hour to find. Yes, I gotta tell you, buyer beware on the, using the trademark systems. Um, the fact of the matter is it's very complex and I didn't understand it myself. So that saying, I, I feel your pain, I think that's a great saying, I feel your pain. Anyway. We do, and it's a little too early to say this, but we actually have a machine learning application that helps in the categories of defining where that trademark should fall. And we're trying to make it more turbo tax like so that it's a question and answer, so that it gives you different answers if you go down, if you answer differently, you can go down different tracks and then compare those tracks and select the one that you think fits best. Because right now, it's, it's all on you. You have to understand the categories and so forth. And I, I don't think that's really fair for an entrepreneur or somebody who's just new to the business. So we're trying to make it a lot easier with that machine learning algorithm. Six months? Okay, six months. He's gonna come back, ah, oh, it's not ready. Yeah. Right, the, the old IT conundrum, right? We have another question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm really looking forward to the rest of the evening. Thank you very much for having me. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Good afternoon, everybody in the room and everybody remote. It's Chris Spina with VMware. I think I know many of you. Um, I am incredibly pleased and proud to introduce our second speaker. 
Vince Lombardi famously said, football is a game of inches. Olympic rifle is a game of tenths of a millimeter. So imagine you're over, those of you in the room, you're over where Marty is in the corner. You're looking at that dot on my business card. It's the size of the period at the end of a sentence in 12 point type. You're looking to hit that with a projectile. And if you're good, like our next speaker, you can hit that projectile 60 times in the course of a match. Now, the difference between a perfect shot in Olympic rifle and a shot that causes groans is three millimeters. In Lima, Peru, in winning his spot on the Olympic team, our speaker shot an aggregate on 60 shots of plus or minus one millimeter across the entire 60 shots. So out of a perfect 654, he shot a 633.5. That is a US record and tied the world record. Did I get that right? Yep. Excellent. Um, I'm proud to say I've known this man since he was 15 years old. I've watched him compete at the high school level, at the collegiate level, in the Olympics in 2016, in the Pan Am Games in, uh, in Lima, Peru in 2019, qualify for the Olympics. I'm looking forward to watching him shoot in the Olympics when it finally takes place. So you know you've made it when you can be referred to as a single name, Cher, Madonna, Beyonce. In the shooting community, all you have to say is, I know Lucas. People are like, wow, you know Lucas? I am proud to say that I know Lucas Kaczynski, and I'm very pleased to introduce Lucas Kaczynski today. My name is Lucas Kaczynski. I'm a 2016 U.S. Olympian, and shooting is my Olympic sport. My dad was in the Marine Corps for 30 years, and um, when he was stationed in Norway, he got his orders to go down to the Pentagon, um, and we we moved there in between my eighth and ninth grade. Uh, once we settled in, and I started attending school, my parents said, "Pick a sport." you know, find any sport that you, that you like. And um, I was watching the morning announcements one day and the Robinson Rifle Team had a, a little advertisement up there and said, come to our after school meeting for an intro. And I showed up late to the meeting. Um, and the coach gave me a quick lesson on being on time, being respectful, you know, all, all the things that um, anybody would probably give a kid. And I thought, this is gonna be a really cool experience. I really gotta do this. I started shooting. Um, through my freshman year, I wasn't really good. I, I was the last person to letter on the team that year. Um, and by the end of my, my freshman year, it really motivated me to you know, get better equipment, study more, and then as time went on, I went from the last place person on my team to the first place person on my team. I think what's magical about this sport is that it's so, it's so easy and yet it's so ungodly hard. It's, it's very easy just to hit the target, to hit the center of the target. But when you lay down there for hours and the standard of success is so high, it truly becomes not just shooting the gun, but the ultimate test of self-discipline. Yeah, this sport has taught me self-discipline, self but most importantly, patience. The moment I made the Olympic team, a lot of self-doubt went away and a lot of confidence moved into its place. From a military background, my, my father, my brother, my grandfather, to the other side of my family, my mom's side of the family that is full of police officers. My family's very big and they've dedicated their lives to serving our country and this allows me to give back to my country in my own way. My advice to young athletes who just started off in shooting sports would be to, to dive directly into the heart of the beast and invest some serious time into it and learn about it and to get a good understanding of, you know, this is my skill level, this is where I'm going. And then after spending some time, write down your goals. What do you want to get out of it? 
I want U.S. shooting industries to gain a curiosity and a passion for international shooting. And I want them to start making products here in the United States for us to use overseas. Look at our guns, look at our butt plates, look at our sights, whatever. Start making those here domestically so that we can challenge overseas teams and their made products. If you design a product and you want it tested, send it here and I'll test it for you. I'm here. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in and joining us today. Thank you, everybody online, for you know giving me this opportunity to come by and well talk to all of you. This is really cool, and I get you know thanks again for letting me do this. So I'm going to share with you guys a little bit of what I do and a little bit of the technology that's associated with it, and and I'm going to reflect on some of those things, some of the stuff that I go and use, whatever, to in an experience that I had last year at the Pan American Games that got me to where I am today. Um, so if we want to go ahead and put that up. So, so the relentless pursuit of perfection. The margin of error. So I'm starting this off by showing you guys where I was at the 2016 Olympic Games. And so the course of fire is 60 record shots. The maximum score per shot is a 10.9. The international standard is a 10.5 at World Cups. And that's those World Cups, there's four every year, there's 16 every quad. Um, a 6.30 is averaging about a 10.5, and that will guarantee you a finals berth, so a chance to medal and to compete for any of those quotas throughout those four years. Um, but that initial score, or I guess that 630 mark, that is starting to rise as far as the competition level. The picture on the right shows the actual rankings of the 2016 Olympic event, or the 2016 men's air gun event that I competed in four years ago. And my performance, I shot a 622.3. I ended up in 21st place. The cutoff was 625.5. There's only 3.2 points separating 8th and 21st place. And so to kind of conceptualize just how small of a margin of error that is, maybe three or four mistakes, some timing that was a little bit different, just small things that occurred that pushed me down in that ranking list, human things that I did. Under the, under the immense pressure. Um, and so ending up in 21st place, by the time I got off the firing line, I walked back to see my parents and my, and my girlfriend and my co college coach. It, I've already made up my mind that I was going to do this for another four years. It's like, that is not how I wanted to perform. That's not how I wanted to, to compete. And I made mistakes that I knew that I was making, but I ignored and didn't have that discipline to stop and to give it another chance before actually taking that shot. And so I really dove into um, looking into more training, learning more, being more mature on stuff, working harder, getting the right equipment, um, exploring what I needed for myself and my values, and trying to get to know what I needed to do to be that true, the true Olympian, the true, that lifestyle and embrace it fully. And so over the course of the last few years, you know, I started really diving into the difference between subjectivity and objectivity. You know, what feels good versus, you know, what, what is actually good, what is measurably excellent. Um, you know, the subjectivity is using this idea of confidence and mindfulness to make progress towards a goal. Um, this relies on trust to maintain momentum. Objectivity, to measure success and progress um, through relevant information, score, speed, size, density, time, whatever, if there's a number to it, there is cause and effect that can cause changes. And so using some of this and where I was going, um, I started really embracing the, the subjectivity, really kind of digging deep to my, to my why, like why do I do this sport? Well, you know, what, what really does this for me? And I knew I wanted to represent our nation again. I wanted to have that opportunity four years later to compete in the Olympics. Um, how is I going to get there? I've really identified with this mantra called what's important now. And so for those of you guys who watch college football, the name Lou Holtz, he really coined this term, what's important now, and he would ask his football players, what's important now, 30, 40 times a day. What's important now? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to class, coach. What's important now? I'm 
doing this thing right now. What's important now for me is you know, making sure I maintain eye contact with this camera. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, I got, I got confident. I, I identified you know, what I was working for with some of these tangible things. And I'm like, you know what, I, I'm confident. I'm focusing on what's important. And my stuff didn't really get any better. I just kind of got a little bit stagnated. I, my improvement didn't go anywhere. And so I looked, it's like, well, I feel good, but I'm not that good. How do I change that? And so then that's when I started digging into these objective guidelines. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you guys this little bit of a trainer. It's called a SCAT trainer. It's an IR laser camera based training system that's actually mounted onto our guns. And so what this thing does is that it measures all of the recorded, or records all movement on the target. And it breaks it down into different series of information. The greatest benefit of this thing is that it allows athletes to visualize and then understand what's happening as they're, as they're um, executing the shot. And so the cool thing about this, all the information can be stored, it can be looked and reflected upon back later, and it's given into a different light. And so instead of just looking through the sight picture and wondering, well, why isn't anything working? They can reflect back on it immediately or later on later um, and just see what's going on. And so it, it can also insinuate like why. Like why did my shot end up going in that direction? Why am I shooting in the middle? Why am I doing this or that? And then it also empowers the, you know, the athletes, the coaches, the people involved in looking at this information to, well, diagnose it, to understand and to learn. Um, can we get that video up? So this is the SCAT trainer system. We can go ahead and pause here. We're going to go column by column and just kind of show what all this information does. So on the very far left-hand side of the screen with the pound sign, we've got the number of shots. Direction, the next column over is direction. The one next to that is the result. And so the result is measured by millimeters. A 10.5 on shot number 57, you get 10.5 points. Of all these 10 shots on this series, I shot a 106.3, looking down there at the bottom part. Next to that is time, how much time is taken with the gun actually pointing at the target. 10.0. The 10.0 is the actual center of the target, and that percentage number that falls underneath it is the percentage of the person aiming at the middle of the 10 ring, or at, the, I guess, the outside of the 10 ring. And then next to that is 10AO. 10AO is the relative size of the hold in reference to the target. And so say if somebody is totally you know, aiming off on the side of the target, they can still hold an excellent hold, and that's what that number shows. And next to that is 10A5, where it just makes the standard a little bit higher. S1, that shows how fast the barrel is moving one second before the shot. S2 shows how fast the barrel is moving 0.25, or I guess you know, 250 milliseconds before the shot. And then DA, that last value there, is the movement between when the shot is taken and where the shot actually lands, like the actual distance between those two points. So let's go ahead and press play. So this is what our target looks like. And that would be me coming down and centering the shot onto the target, aiming, holding in the middle, and then executing the shot. Let's go ahead and watch that one more time. Let's go ahead and pause right here. And so what SCAT also does is that it measures, it measures um, designates colors, whatever, to the different portions of the, of the hold. And so this green color is the majority of the hold, the actual movement on the target. There's a yellow line that's in there, and that actually measures what's happening you know, 250 milliseconds right before that shot is taken. There's that blue line. That is the movement of the breach. That is when you pull the trigger, how, how much movement there is as you're executing the shot. And then there's that red line, which is the follow through. Do you follow through on that shot and make sure that the gun is truly pointing in the middle throughout that whole time? Um, let's go ahead and press play. And so we're going to compare this to a, well, a different shot. Let's go ahead and pause there. 
So those, those two shots, number 57 and number 58 of this file, were taken at a different, I guess they're, um, they're taken back to back. But on this bottom bar, on the very bottom part of the screen were these little ticks, that actually measures time, the amount of time between each shot. And so if you noticed, there's actually a pretty big chunk of white space there where I did nothing. I sat there and I held and I relaxed. And so actually, go ahead and press play. Um, and so the body, the, the stress, being able to control things and maintain the differences of, as far as the hold or, or whatever, um, making decisions in accordance to that based on objectivity, kind of like here, this here target, um, can show. These are the two targets next to each other. And we'll go ahead and pause right here. So these two shots, taken back to back, minutes apart, and the values associated with both of these, with both of these, tar uh, both of these shots, um, we can then insinuate like, OK, let's assume what's going on here. Shot number 57, I was coming up on a super duper monster score. I was shooting the best ever at that time in a training session. I was agitated. I w my heart rate was high. The pressure was feeling real. I'm in this safe environment, but here I am dealing with myself and my wants and needs, and the body is responding. I shot a 10.5, and frankly, I was probably lucky to shoot a 10.5. My position, I've worked on it to where it's so stable that if my heart rate gets out of control, I can still maintain a good 10 ring hold, which is what happened there on the right side of the screen. Going over to where you see 46.2 and 44.7, that's how fast the gun is moving millimeters per second. If we compare that to the left side, which is 19.2 and 16.6, .6, that is a lot slower. Giving, that, giving myself the amount of time to calm down and to get my body under control is what causes those numbers to go down. And I was able to make a conscious decision to regain control of my process and how I function the rifle. Um, and so using this training system, I've been able to objectively test things. I test things like blood sugar level. I test things, literally my heart rate, when I'm thinking certain thoughts and how that responds as far as measuring um, heart rate and blood pressure. Um, this allows me to see how wearing insoles in the boots affect how my position settles on the target. Um, and those are all the things that I have done for myself. Can we go back to the PowerPoint? I also use this tool to run, to run my business. And so my business is called Team Winning Solutions. And I started this to develop the next generation of shooters. So using technology like SCAT and Zoom and other platforms, we're able to see things and, um, and spread knowledge and interact with younger athletes in a way to where we can diagnose stuff instead of just shooting on paper and getting rounds down range. Um, since I've started this business back in 2017, I've developed over 40 collegiate athletes, or sorry, 40 athletes nationwide. Most of them are still currently on my team and still working to get onto a college team. But in the last three years, I've had 18 of my, of my kids compete in the NCAA. Um, and I'm very proud of that. We've been able to objectively measure their success and change their expectations and help them work towards their goals using things like SCAD. Um, this, ex this strengthened my ability to compete because I was able to reinforce the objectively good things because I was able to make it replicate with so many other athletes, so many of my peers through this system, and then I applied it to my own training and be able to take ownership of the things that, I, that I'm doing. This picture here is me at the Pan American Games. And using this, this system, this, this, training, this laser training system, allowed me in a stressful situation that I'm going to talk to you guys about in about three seconds to succeed under a mess pressure and terrible conditions. So the Pan American Games was a year ago. Um, I, I got selected to go. Um, represent our nation, we had to get one air gun quota. So there's two Americans going. We had to get into the top two slots to earn one quota for somebody who competed at the Olympic Games. Um, I think we're still here. Okay. So got on a plane in Colorado Springs, headed down to 
Houston to get into a, um, to meet my layover and do processing there before going down to the Pan American Games. My flight out of Colorado Springs was delayed due to weather, and I actually missed my connection, connecting flight. I was actually really excited because I got a first class ticket for really cheap. It was like 50 something bucks. It was really cool. And so the United treated me very well. And so I got a hotel. They sent me over and I you know, just hung out until 6 p.m. the next day. I woke up the next morning and I had immense stomach pain. It's like, hmm, you know, maybe I just ate something pretty bad for dinner. I'm not sure you know, what this is, but I'm, just, I'm choosing to ignore it. So get on the plane to go to Peru. I still have this, this problem. I, I'm still feeling this pain. Get to, I finally get to Peru. We're getting in there at 1 o'clock in the morning and get off the plane, walk over to where, where our gear is supposed to end up being, and my guns and gear bag are not there. Okay, So I sat there for about an hour for, for nothing. Get on the bus, head down to the, Olymp or the Paral Par Pan American Village, and I met with one of the USOPC contacts. And I said, hey, you know, I've got this stomach pain. Um, I'm not sure if like, I can go see somebody now about it or should I go so see somebody later? And it's like, well, do you think it's like, life-threatening or anything? I'm like, eh, probably not. Well, OK, we can just come in tomorrow when it, when it opens at 8 AM. OK, cool. Also, my gear is not here. We'll, OK, we'll figure that out later. So I go you know, sleep, sleep for a little bit, wake up the next morning. I go down to sports med. And the first thing as you know, talking with one of the doctors down there is he's doing the appendicitis thing. He's you know, trying to see if that pop causes any kind of issues. And it doesn't. So he's like, well, have some ibuprofen, and we'll just kind of keep an eye on it. Cool beans. All right. So then I go to the range because there are still competitions going on, and I watch the men's 3 by 40 event occur where Americans Tim Sherry and Michael McPhail won gold and silver back to back at the Pan Am Games. And that was really cool to watch. Um, after that event, I went to go use the restroom, and I almost passed out in the bathroom. I was like, oh, OK, something's actually wrong now. Something is actually probably bad. So I went and found the USA Shooting Sport Medicine person. And she and I said, OK, once we get back to the village, we'll link up with one of the USOPC doctors. And we're going to go to the ER. Get there, link up with this guy who, very thankfully, he spoke Spanish. And so we got into this car. We got out onto the road. And we had an escort. We drove about 35 minutes to this thing, passing thousands of cars on the way over there. And they rushed me into this room. I sit down in there. They give me an IV, and we wait as I got this pain in my stomach, as it's getting a little bit worse. As we're sitting there, doctors come in. They're talking with the USOPC doctor, trying to figure out what the issue is. And then he leaves for a little bit later. We're waiting, waiting, waiting. And then the doctor's sitting there on his phone. And he looks up. And he turns over, opens the canopy, and there's a surgical team sitting there. And his eyes get wide, and he closes. He goes, I'll be right back. And so he goes out there. I don't speak Spanish. And they're speaking Spanish. And I'm like, oh my god, this is going to be terrible. They open it back up again. They look at me. I'm sitting there looking at them. They close it back again. They talk some more. They come in there. And every single, I mean, there's 15 people. And they all did the, the stomach thing on the pop. It never hurt. It never did, not once. And they're all standing around. It's like, OK, so they took blood. They ordered a CAT scan. I'm sitting there waiting. And it comes back. And they say, well, you've got a kidney infection. Got it. Cool. All right. They let me out of the hospital at 2 AM. I get back to the Pan Am Village at 3 AM. PET, the pre-event training, was at 9. It took us an hour and a half to get there. So we left just around 7.30 uh, to get down. So I only had about three-ish hours of sleep after I finally calmed down. And by the time we get there, luckily, somebody went and grabbed my gear from the airport and brought it to me. So this is cool. I didn't have to go back to the airport. Somebody brought it to me. When I open it up, I'm missing equipment, missing headphones, missing ammo, missing earplugs, tools, things that I needed just, just to prepare. And so I was able to borrow equipment from my peers and get things situated, get the gun in position. I started taking sighting shots, trying to make sure the gun works. It doesn't work. So we're sitting there making, we're tuning, we're trying to figure it out. And I get the gun to work. I get it um, kind of tuned into where I like it. PET stops, and that's it. I'm not allowed to live fire that gun until the next day at the actual match. And so I'm standing there and trying to come to terms with what's going on. It's like, OK, gun's broken. A bunch of my stuff's gone. And I can't sit down. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and pop over to that, to that next that screenshot from the, there we go. So the next day, I go to the, go to the range, and after. I did my usual warm-up, 
and I get on to the firing line. We get 15 minutes to do sliders and prep. That's our preparation time where we take shots and it doesn't matter. And so something that I determine in the first few minutes of that sliders is I'm, I'm holding on to something there on the left. I'm still holding good. I'm in pain. I'm using stuff that isn't mine. But I can still hold just like that on the left side. And so with all my training, the objective training, you know, cause effect, I knew that that was what I was getting, regardless of the pain, regardless of anything else that's going on. I could rely on the fact that I knew I had that going for me. Got it. All I got to do is do that 60 times. The first 12 shots were excellent. I was on a world, world record pace, and I'm sitting there. I'm looking on my 13th shot, and I got the gun in my hand, and I go, come on to the target. I pull the trigger. Trigger's pulled. I'm still staring at the target. What? Pow. The gun broke again. It's coming untuned as I'm sitting there. And so I was fortunate enough to actually remember to bring my wrenches and my screwdriver on the line. So I'm literally in between every single shot, I am sticking wrenches and screwdrivers into my action to make sure that the sear stops moving. And so the sear is what, what causes this trigger to actually fire the gun. And so I did that for another 47 shots. I'm still holding good. But every time I pulled the trigger, I did not know when that gun was going to fire. And it changed every single time. I shot the exact same score as I did at the Olympic Games three years before then with the 622.3, whatever. It's, at that point, it seemed pretty fitting. And I get off the line, I go up to the national coach, Dan Durbin, and I say, the trigger is still messed up. And I just kept messing with it the entire time. OK, so we ripped, out this, we ripped apart this entire gun. We had one hour. I'm in fifth place going into the final. We had one hour to figure this whole thing out. We rip it apart. And we see very bluntly what the issue is. We fix it. We now know that the trigger works. Now I just got to sit here and wait for the final to start. And so the final occurs. And I'm sitting here. I'm going, what's important now? I'm going to work on every single shot. I'm going to go through this 24, 24 shot final. And I'm going to win us this, this quota. That's why I'm here. By the end of the day, and if you want to go ahead and go back to that picture, um, I started off on the left side for the first maybe hmm, five shots. And the next 19 was the, left, the right side. Because I was losing my mind. My heart rate was high. I was seeing weird. The pain was worse. And at that point, I'm taking it literally one shot at a time. Go back to the picture before, before this. The pan or the, um... So this, picture, this shot was actually done the second before the last shot. What happens is in ISSF finals, they eliminate people leading up to the final shots. And so we got to the last two contenders there. It was me and an Argentinian. And I had won the quota. I achieved my goal. And at that point, my body physiologically changed. I calmed down. And with that, my blood pressure stopped. Or not stopped. <laughs> <laughs> it, it went down. My heart rate went down. And I got real dizzy. It was bad. And I went and picked up the gun. And I'm looking down the sight. And I don't even see the black dot on the wall. I trusted my MPA and everything. As I come down, and I can kind of see this hazy thing as I'm getting ready to pull the trigger. Pow. I'm like, that's it. I just, I, I'm second place at least. OK, that's cool. And I put the gun down to look down at the screen, and I shot a perfect 10.9. At the same time, the, the, the competitor shot like a mid-9. So the separation between us now became significant. All I got to do is shoot a mediocre shot, and I'm walking away with this thing. And picked up the gun. And at that point, I'm excited. So I just went, I calmed all the way down. Blood pressure dropped, heart rate dropped, and now I'm amped right back up. And I'm you know, losing my mind, tweaking out, shaking, whatever. And I pick up the gun. I can see the dot now, but I can't put, put the gun in the middle of it. <laughs> Just took the shot. It was a 9.9. .9. It's like, whew, that's it. And then I won a quota for the United States. Yeah. But the only reason, the only reason I was able to survive, and that's what it was, was surviving in that circumstance is doing a lot of this objective training, figuring out cause effect, what's going on with this scat trainer. And so with, with all the preparation, I really had to be mindful and trust the training and everything that I did to be successful. 
um, with the things that I, that I worked on. In tangent to that, with all the people that I represent, not just the nation or my family or whatever, but there's a lot of teenagers and kids who, who I work with who would probably have made fun of me if I didn't win <laughs> because they're, they're kids and that's what they do. So that about wraps up my stuff. Does anybody have any kind of curious questions, whatever, um, from online or from the room? So right, so right now, the US Olympic team has 19 members. S somewhere between October and March, we're still trying to figure out with COVID when we're going to have the second part, part trials for the last team. We'll have, another, we'll have another four people. So we're going to end up with 23 members, uh, two people in almost every event. Um, as far as when the Olympics are going to happen, they're going to be next year during that July time frame, the end of July, early August time period. Um, so fingers crossed that they maintain um, you know, the planning and the course for that uh, moving forward. So right now it's postponed, but it's not canceled. So. All right. Thank you, Lucas, so much for that. I definitely can relate to the disappointment when you're out of ammo. <laughs> it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, as a cop for 15 years, we were trying to hit center mass. I have an unbelievable appreciation for the precision and control that you have to be able to hit that mark with such precision. Thank you. So thank you again thank very you much. For your service. Thank you. So talking a little bit about Las Vegas, we have Barry West and Chrissy Kuhn. We're both CE, uh, CES government co-chairs to talk a little bit about Las Vegas coming up. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Chrissy. First off, I want to thank uh, Lucas again. That was an awesome story that you just gave. And we want to donate as part of GBF. We'd like to make a donation towards your organization as you get ready for the Olympic Games. Thank you so much. And we'd also like to extend an invite to Las Vegas in January uh, while we're out there. Uh, in person. Big deal. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Is is Jamie still here? Jamie, outstanding presentation as well. I know what it's like being a CIO. What I really admired about your presentation is how deeply you've gotten with the business side. It's so important uh, in any to be successful in any CIO job is to understand the business, and you've taken the time over the last year and a half to really peel back the onion and understand what your business does. And uh, you were out in front uh, because of that. So congratulations on the job you're doing. Um, hope you all like the new branding of uh, our name, Edge. When you think of uh, the word Edge or Edge Computing, the concept really means uh, you know, going out and capturing, uh, storing, processing, and analyzing data near your client. Well, with, with our new branding, we want to be near our stakeholders, our clients, whether it's in D.C., whether it's in Vegas, whether it's virtual, whether it's in person, and being a little edgy while we do it. Doing things like this today, where we had a prominent CIO from government here with one of the world's best shooters that's out there. We want to be different, and we want to be able to capture the value and add extra value to all of you that are members of GBF, because we do think we have something special uh, going forward. So um, thank you for that. We're really looking forward for the next six months to a year as we gear up uh, for EDGE and what that means. We also want to thank our production company. We, as many of you know, we've, done, we've had some struggles over the last four to five months with going virtual. And these guys, you guys kick butt, by the way. <laughs> Great job. These guys are out of Richmond, Virginia. They came up. They're going to be with us going forward, and they are professionals in what they do, and you can tell. So thank you so much. Uh, we're going to end next door, or next, yeah, in the next room over with a reception, so please uh, join us for that. Sorry we went a little bit over, but I think it was worth it with the two presenters that we had today. So thank you. Thank you for coming out. And I just want to take a second to thank our global participants. We've had folks from Dominican Republic, from Paris, France, from the Netherlands, from the UK, and even Ghana. So thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you all in Las Vegas. Thank you. We have to open our country. You know, I, I had an expression, the cure can't be worse 
than the problem itself, right?